Welcome to the Tetra Health and Performance Podcast. Today, we're exploring an excellent topic. We're exploring advanced training. And we're very lucky today to have a very knowledgeable guest today. We've got Tim Davies from Sydney Uni. He is an education-focused lecturer at Sydney Uni, and he, his, his whole effort is about strength and conditioning and advanced training modalities as well. We've written quite a few papers on this topic, and I cannot wait to, to pick his brain on this and find out some great information. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, very, very excited. Fantastic. So, first thing to dive into is kind of like, um, what is advanced training? So, Tim, like, how would you explain advanced training? We had a little talk about it before, um, before the podcast, and uh, kind of what you touched on there is a perfect example. Yeah, um, I think it, advanced training, I think, is something that gets thrown around quite a lot in something that just looks wild and different, and that and that means that it's advanced. Um, but I think from from my view, advanced training is something that a coach will naturally do in order to continue to see adaptations with their athletes. So as their athletes get more trained, they reach closer to their, uh, to their genetic potential and therefore it becomes harder to stimulate any other adaptation. So, uh, so typically advanced training becomes much more planned, much more specific. And from a periodization perspective, which is what planning is, but from a periodization perspective, it does become a lot more undulating in order to manage fatigue. So undulating meaning that you might have very strenuous sessions that are mixed in with active recovery or, or, or lower intensity sessions um, to continue to see adaptation. And, and on that, something like recovery becomes a lot more important. Um, so it becomes a, a lot more systematic in, in training and recovery modalities. Is typically how I see advanced training. Yeah, I love that because we, we see it all the time, right? We see um, when you have a, like someone coming off the street ready to start training, well, pretty much you can throw anything at them and they're ready to adapt, right? Yeah. And first of all, their goals are normally quite broad anyway. So their goals are what we would pretty say not advanced goals. They're kind of like, I want to feel fitter. I want to feel better in general. And mm. because they have a low kind of base, it's quite easy to kind of throw anything at them and they're going to improve still to what you supply them. They're going to improve in them directions. But at the same time, if someone is then trained for a few years and they are getting better and better and they're kind of reaching their points of, uh, of progress and it's getting harder for them to make improvements slowly on, then that, is that when we deploy an advanced training method? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like, like, and, and, and that's why I think it fits in with what I said initially about like it's something that coaches will just naturally do when, when an athlete stops, pro stops progressing, which is, which is uh, inevitable. And it's not even just athletes. It's anyone. Really, like if anyone stops, um, stops. Uh, how do I put this? Stops progressing in their training, then more advanced techniques need to be uh, employed. But that could be something just increasing volume a little bit, you know, and by or increasing intensity or something like that. But over time, that thought process gets more and more advanced. And the idea there as well is that. Um, we're looking at something a bit more specific eventually with advanced training as well, aren't we? Where we're Absolutely. actually looking at like, so they have a specific goal in place, a target in place that we're driving them towards because um, you're speaking about undulated. Well, first off, like when we're training someone, we need to control their improvements. Like when someone does reach that high threshold, what ends up happening is they have to work really, really hard to improve their threshold there. Therefore, then they're going to have to have a recovery on the other side. But at the same time, that if we really want to improve something specific, then we're going to have to spend a lot more time building up that specific quality and then even stepping away from that specific quality as well. Yeah, in a, in a very phasic approach, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, that's why I like the example of powerlifting where it's very, it's very simple to measure, it's very simple to um, see as well, um, where typically people who are in a resistance training setting will do all these different exercises and they'll, and they'll eventually just get strong at all these different exercises where powerlifting and I guess weightlifting as well being two movements and powerlifting being three movements that in powerlifting you have three movements that you need to get unbelievably good at um, and recently there was the world raw powerlifting championships on in in Malta um, and Ooh. the numbers that were being lifted there were just absolutely incredible because all they did was to train for that movement all those three movements that's what that, that's that's all they did and that's that's a very typical profile of someone being a 
Well, your goal is clear, right? Three movements to get strong at. Then you have a competition date, some a date to train up to. So you've got a length of phase to slowly build up uh, your intensity, your volume, your strength towards. And you've only got three mo- three movements to dedicate your program towards. So you've mapped out like most of your program with the timeline and your specificity of your three positions. Yeah. So and it's very simple s- stuff. Yeah, it sounds it sounds very simple, doesn't it? But yeah, <laughs> it can get a bit it can get a bit crazy at times. And you uh, previously uh, were a powerlifter, Tim? Yeah. Um. So I uh, yeah. So so I always describe powerlifting as my first love. Um. <laughs> so I've been doing powerlifting since 2013. Um. I made three Australian junior teams during that wow. time: 2013, 14, 15. Um, What's um? Is junior up to 23? Is it? Uh, it, it varies in federation, um, yeah. but but in the federation I was, that I was in, yes, 23 was yeah. the last year. Um, and then after I did my last year of juniors, uh, so last competition was in Tashkent, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, <laughs> which was which was very very uh, very unique. Um, yeah, I, I ended up having to get elbow surgery for um, a pretty serious ligament injury that I um, sustained that I think that I think I sustained while I was working at a restaurant. Um, and yeah, that kind of just, I just ruined my powerlifting career to be quite honest. Um, but I, I'm back competing now. Like I'm nowhere near as competitive as what I was, but that's okay. Like, like you don't need to be competitive all the time. Yeah. Um, but I was also doing my PhD at the time, um, of that, uh, elbow surgery. So it kind of worked out well that I could start focusing on to burn in the research. candle at both ends. Yeah. It yeah. sounds like a busy period. Yeah, it was, it was just, just off that, because I, I find this, um, this, and I'm sure you have some really interesting information on this. It's like where we talk a lot about kind of the Western method and the Eastern method of um, of coaching and training, especially mm. towards kind of powerlifting. And there's been um, I have a couple of Russian friends, and they're they're already spe- they're always spewing out information. I'm like, where did you find that information? And they're like, no, you can't read it because you don't speak Russian. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah. Oh damn! Wait, I'll wait for that. it to be translated. Then. Yeah, there's lots um, of that. Or can you explain to me? Like, no. I know. Um, as if they have these kind of like hidden um like kind of hidden ideas when they do because lots of the very famous strength conditioning coaches have come from russia right yeah. and um lots of the like amazing texts have come from russia as well books yeah. that have been translated but um there is also um the talk of kind of like how um uh the, the russian teams have trained the bulgarians and stuff like that how they did always use to throw a little bit more intense they were the first people really to throw a lot more intensity yeah their, i was about to say a training. little bit is a, a yeah. bit of an understatement yeah. and there's there's always the talk as well is how um how they actually got so much intensity thrown at them and i think this is a good segue to what we're talking about today as well yeah. because it's the management load and and there is always the talk about how a lot of these countries will throw so much intensity at their individuals it's just like if you break then next guy's coming on and he's going to do it and then you just find your genetically made up person who can handle these are mad qualities of load and they get stronger and stronger from it until eventually again you might break them down but Hopefully they've won a gold medal in the process. Is it Rocky <laughs> exactly. two or Rocky three? Which yeah, one's right, the one yeah. with Dol- if he yeah, dies, he dies. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> yeah, like I think I think that's a very I think that's a very common method that they use back, uh, especially like in the fifties and sixties, um, where like especially especially the most famous Bulgarian weightlifting team who would be squatting like upwards of ninety percent easily. Like like I, I think ninety percent might have been a, a recovery day for them wow. at, uh, uh, at times. Um, and whichever athletes broke were just the ones that were considered not not eligible, I guess, for the for the weightlifting team. Um, and that, I mean, it's obviously it obviously has ethical issues. But when you're when you're at that level of of performance, and you have, and like I don't know if this is confirmed or or, or if this is accurate, but it would make sense if it was that you have the state financing your team. In order to do well, which is how a lot of countries work now, um, where there's a lot of financial benefit in training your athletes as hard as they possibly can in order to win gold medals at the Olympics, then if I was a coach, I would be I would I would be doing the same kind of thing, especially at, at I, especially at that time where the knowledge about training was very situated within your own organization, so or or, or within your own. Um, like or within your own country, like you mentioned, that Russia are very, very uh, secretive with uh, with what they with what they share, and that still remains the same, especially now with China. Like China are the best weightlifting team yeah. on the planet, and if you want to know how they train, they will not tell you. Um, like yes, there are some Instagram pages that 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 might bring it up, but they're they're not on the Chinese coaching team, um, and 
yeah, like I wouldn't want to share my secrets in how I win gold medals either. And it's oh yeah, of course. Yeah. So so yeah, yeah. From a research perspective, it's really interesting because research is, relies on publication and 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 public dissemination of information. But um, when you're at that level and in, in in China and 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 places like America and um, former Soviet countries as well, that yeah, they like to keep things to themselves, which is really, which is really interesting. Well, um, also at the same time, is lots of the information about managing load came from them a little bit later on as well, like um, yeah. like the super compensation kind mm -hmm. of um, the idea of super compensation, which is to say that um, when I am training at high intensities, then I actually am creating a stress on my body, and therefore that stress then needs to be recovered from. And when I recover from it, I want to actually allow myself enough, enough time not to just actually recover from the stimulus create, created, but super compensate would be the word and it would mean to actually come a little bit higher up from recovery ready to then perform at a greater load mm. and a lot of the research has come from them probably from putting that people at such a high level that then 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 discovering that actually if we give them that day or two or half a day or give them a session of lower intensity afterwards we can then peak them back up right yeah yeah that's um that's the fundamental basis of what of what is generally called training theory yeah. um that there is a stimulus that the body needs to react to um, and that stimulus is very similar to how we relate to any type of biological stress, um, which, which has been known for a long time. Um, it's now currently being challenged whether that's that uh, whether that is, um, I guess that that supercompensation uh, uh, effect from a biological stress is a necessary component of um, of any adaptation to training. There's a lot of uh, what I would call um, uh, uh, academic arguments <laughs> through through research papers um, that are, are trying to challenge that idea, but generally, yeah, I, 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 I'm 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 on the side of that. I think this occurs, um, and there are many different models to explain it, which which I find really really useful. Um, yeah, sorry, go on. I think it's something interesting to to frame as well too. Like when you're talking about these uh, modalities that have been used to get these amazing results. We have to remember too, we are talking of the 1% of the 1%. These athletic individuals that have been training their specialized sport for a massive amount of years are probably in their early 20s, can highly recover. If you're talking Eastern, Europe, uh, Eastern European countries, probably enhanced to a, to a large degree, especially in these strength sports. So like when a general population person, when you're, when you're bloody 35-year-old dad of three wants to pick up a strength program, it's going to be very different than this young 20 stud that is had a coach since day one that specialized in this olympic sport their ability to tolerate the volume and adaptations are going to be very very different i think it's very important to remember when we're using these type of framing these type of programs that it's highly specialized to these individuals that have been training for quite some time and not generally for or a starting position for your everyday individual mm. um so tim with that in mind, like you talked, you mentioned stimuli and sensors, and you also like the idea of today being advanced training methods. How do you how do you control these things that we've kind of just discussed? This their intensities, these kind of like how can we track them? How can we watch them? How can we make sure we are working people at the right intensities to see progress with their specific um, training? Yeah, I, I I think it's important to first define what intensity is, um, and there's a lot of like like even even at university level, there are there are differing opinions of what intensity is. Um, so my, my opinion of intensity, which is evidence informed, um, is that it is a response to how hard a particular workload is to that person. And you can measure it subjectively with something like an RPE, or you can measure it in a physiological sense. So in running, you can measure it with heart rate in, in most people, right? That's a really easy way to do it. Um, in, in strength training, for example, you can measure intensity through a couple of ways, how, how high that load is relative to a maximum, so a one RM, ten RM, whatever. But the other really, um, the other really interesting part about intensity with uh, with strength training is that in strength training we do repetitions, and part of the intensity argument in terms of workload, if we are tracking workload, is how many reps were done and how hard those reps were. So how far away from failure you were. That that predicts intensity to a large degree, particularly in, in something like a hypertrophy type training program where volume is important, but how far away you are from failure is, I would say, more important. Um, I think what you'll find is that you can handle a lot less volume 
which is which is theoretically true. You can handle a lot less volume if you push each set hard, like close to failure, if not to failure. Yeah. So, and not volume for volume's sake, right? Like we need and a certain level of intensity in volume. We can't, exactly. we can't just be going up oh, volume. I just did that much work, but yeah. how much of that work was significant intensity? Yeah, yeah, and that's why I don't like the the notion of time under tension being being the main driver of hypertrophy. Like what I say to students is that it's not just time under tension. I, I like the saying time under significant tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say it's yeah. time and magnitude. Yeah. So yeah. so both of those things will will contribute to, to hypertrophy. And then how you progress that over time is that the amount of time that you spend in that high magnitude of of mechanical tension is what's gonna contribute to long term adaptation to hypertrophy. Learning reps well, we in reserve it. has been a really successful tool that we've used in here. It does take a bit of time for someone without a strength training history. Learning how much they have left in the tank does take a little bit of time. You have to be slowly graded exposure to some heavier weight to truly understand reps in reserve. But one of the best tools that we've found to actually get that close to failure stimulus or that adequate stimulus to drive that hypertrophy or strength, probably, yeah, definitely the most successful tool I think we've used in here. Yeah, I think it's such a basic tool, and I think that it's really sad that not many people use it. <laughs> I, think I, it I think it should be applied. I think I, I have mentioned it before, but I, I would kind of walk into a gym, and if I didn't see it somewhere in the session mentioned or written on the board or something like that, I'd probably walk out because I, um, I feel like, um, w w like you just said yourself, like even looking at heart rate is, is some kind of measure of that. We're, we need to make sure that if we are trying to challenge ourselves and improve, then at some point we are paying attention to that intensity and how do we measure it? Well, subjectively, that is probably one of the, the best ways to measure it, right? Yeah, I think, I think most trainers implore some kind of measure of subjective yep. exertion anyway. Um, so even asking the question after a set of just how hard was that? And then yeah. just getting some, some descriptive answer from that. That's, that's, that's measuring uh, exertion to some extent. But what I like about RIR and, and, and RPE is that you are collecting data that, that you can accurately use. And yes, there are accuracy issues with RPE and, and RIR. Like I definitely want to acknowledge that. But you've got these, these values that you can put into a spreadsheet and, and track over time. It's, it's much easier for a client, I think, to not think about, oh, well, how hard was this? And I need to tell a narrative about how hard it was when, when you can just show them, hey, here's a scale from bed rest to the hardest possible exercise that you've ever done. Where does that fit in with that scale? Um, I think it's much easier for a client to do that. And it's much easier for a coach to visualize that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love it. I think it's a really good, important tool. And, and while it works in that kind of like uh, making sure people are moving forward, it also works perfectly at that pulling people back a little bit. Like, okay, so we can have a, a deload week, an undulated day of lower intensity, and we can say, okay, well, let's work at that kind of three to four reps in reserve rather than what we were doing last week, working at that one to two. Yeah. Right? Which, yeah. yeah, which it plays a role significantly in programming. Yeah, I, I was just about to say, when I, when I was coaching in powerlifting, I would coach through RPE uh, by reps. So I, I actually wouldn't prescribe reps at all. I would prescribe yeah. R, uh, an RPE. And I know, well, I, I knew if, if the athlete did it properly, that's, that's another thing. Um, but if the athlete did it properly, I would know that my, my athlete's exertion would be controlled depending on how, uh, how, I, how I wanted it to be controlled. Um, yeah, so it's something yeah. very similar we do here, like where we kind of give a rather than give a a rep number, which I think is kind of a ridiculous thing to do. We mm. give a rep range, so we say yeah, like yeah, rep range fourteen to seventeen reps. Find a weight where you're going to fatigue at two in two in reserve. Yep, and it kind of does the job for you rather than say I want twelve reps because there might not be the weight that does that. So we need to we need to especially with dumbbells, we need to kind of find that right. So we need to make sure that we're applying a stimulus, right? Exactly. Yeah, and I think. I think having an RPE measured ensures that you, yes there, are, yes, there are other ways of measuring stimulus, but I think if you're looking for something really quick, Boom. measuring, measuring an RPE gives you really a, a decent indicator of what stimulus is being applied to that person, for sure. So apart from RPE, RIR, um, you mentioned there's other methods. And um, what kind of other methods do you really like? Like what other ways can you imply, apply advanced training on someone and, and track it and, keep, and make sure it is advanced? Because that, that's... I, I saw that's where you were going earlier. It's like when we 
however much it's simple, well, in the background, things don't always have to be simple. They should no. actually be like, there should be mm. data being analyzed. We should be looking at what's happening. We should be looking at trends with someone. If we're training someone professionally or we're trying to make sure that they reach goals and we want them to truly reach goals, then we need to be digging into the, digging into the dirt of data and being like, okay, well, this is a trend I see with them. This is when I see them fatigue. This is how I haven't previously made them move. Like they haven't pushed further. Maybe we need to take longer recovery breaks. Maybe we need to do what this, 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 and it. Well, what kind of advanced training tools, methods do you have that can make sure that's happening for someone? Yeah, well, I, I personally have a what's called a linear position transducer, which we're going to talk about velocity-based training, I would, I would imagine now. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, I have one at home. So this is, no, this is not sponsored at, at all, but I, but I just want to say um, that, I, that I do have one, and um, it's called the Vitruve. Um, which is one from Spain, um, and if you are so, it, so if any listeners are interested in velocity-based training, the Spanish research group that um, that does a lot of work in velocity-based training produced some really, really good research. It's led by now Fernando Pereja Blanco, uh, oh, sorry Perejo Blanco, um, and have the to put C- that one in the notes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was led by Juan Jose Gonzalez Badillo. So. Really, really, really cool research group um, in in Spain. But anyway, so how, how these how these systems work is they're measuring how far it doesn't ha- it doesn't have to be a barbell, but it's typically a barbell. Measuring how far the um, the the, ob- the object moves, um, which in in biomechanics we call the the uh, displacement of uh, uh, of that bar, and the system will will pulse every certain period of time and. Um, that that pulse gives an indicator of time, so how how long that that um, tether or, or whatever uh, was was moving. And if you get a displacement value measured in meters or centimeters, and you get a time value measured in seconds, you can measure velocity. Okay, so that's that's generally how most of these systems work. Um, and velocity has a very linear relationship with load, or more more accurately, percent one RM. So as you as you increase in your load towards your 1RM, your velocity will decrease. And the slope of that line is very consistent. So if you go from 60 to 70% 1RM, the change will be the same as if you go to 80 to 90% 1RM. You know what I mean? So, so it's, a, it's a really, really stable way of measuring how, how oh, loads of different things. If, someone's, if someone has adapted, if someone is recovered or not recovered, um, and, and I can provide specific examples of, of, of how you can do that. Like I'm just wary of time as well. Um, no, don't, don't, go, go for it. Go for it. Oh, okay. All right. I'm ready. So, we're not doing too terrible on time. We're doing brilliant. So, um, so if you are looking for that um, adaptation or, or recovery, I guess it's the same logic but just in reverse. Um, if, you're, if you're using a uh, – let's take the example of a back squat, right? And I'll take my example because I, I know these numbers well. So my, my back squat 1RM is, is uh, 195 uh, high bar. Um, and when I was warming up, I would always warm up with the same loads because I'm, I'm very, very specific with what I put on, uh, onto my bar. I'd always warm up with bar 70, 120, 140, 160. And then I, um, if I'm doing a 1RM, I would um, just uh, alter my loads depending on how, how they move. So when I would move 140, I would always look at the velocity that I moved 140 at. And when I was beginning my training program with, with, uh, uh, with the Vitruve, I would start off with 140 being at like 0.59 meters per second. And that number doesn't mean anything to, to anyone, but it's just a number, it's just a reference value that we can use. And then over time, that 140 was lifted at 0.61, 0.63, 0.65, 0.67. And then when I competed, um, I obviously brought my Vitruve with me <laughs> into the into the competition area, which people were very quizzical about. Um, but I lifted 140 when I uh, in my warm up when I was just about to walk onto a platform of the 140 at 0.71 meters per second, and that gave me a really good indicator that because I'm moving 140 faster and faster and faster, and I know that my relationship is linear, meaning it's not going to just dive bomb um, uh, uh, early. Um, if I'm moving 140 faster, then theoretically my 1RM has increased, and I didn't need to do a repetition to failure test. I didn't need to. I didn't need to test at all. I just needed to track my velocity to see if I had adapted, and it's the vice versa if you're either maladapting or not not recovering. If you're lifting something slower than what you would expect, 
your one RM is decreased for that day. That day, it's not. It's not. It's obviously not something that's permanent. Um, but your one RM has decreased for that day. Um, uh, so you can get a good indicator of, of whether they're um, actually recovered. And because one RM fluctuates so much, like there's good. Or, um, oh, I was going to say there's good evidence, but um, there's. Uh, like I think the rule of thumb with 1RM is that on any given minute of any given day, 1RM can fluctuate about 30%, like like up or yep. down, so 15% up or down. I've seen I've seen um, uh, strength coaches in America talk about how, and, and based on studies as well, how it's something like a one rep max in their athletes can go up from up 18 kilos on a good day and down 16 kilos on a bad day. Yeah. So that's, that, that's a massive fluctuation of, of how much weight you is. And, and then like you said, to test that one rep max, you have to put yourself under a really heavy bar and you have to fatigue yourself. And you could even easily step over fatigue, right? Because you might be, if say for example today my one rep max is actually 16 kilos less, but I'm putting myself under weight that's 16 kilos too heavy that day. Yeah. And, and when we talk about risk and reward, like that is a high risk for very low reward on Very that low day. reward, yeah. And the information that you're getting from that outside of the actual lift is incredible. Like you're literally telling you that today this guy's, they're fatigued. They have yeah. maybe too many stresses that they can't handle. Yeah. And, and But the way that you're doing it is kind of like, okay, well, let's look into the future. Like without yeah. having to do that stuff, we're getting yeah. information without having to test or overwork the individual. Yeah, like I would say that you are testing, but it's yeah, just it's just a, it's just a different way of of testing. So so how how I use velocity based training is I actually use what's called a load velocity profile. So essentially, what I do is I I do a um, I do a strength test, so I do a progressive loading test where I start off light and gradually put weight on the bar, and I measure my best velocity at, at each of those loads. And then what I do is I've cre I've created a, a a spreadsheet which which James and Mitch won't won't be surprised in the least um, that. Uh, measures my load velocity profile, and then uh, so, uh, at least 50 different metrics of what I can grab from that load velocity profile. And because I know that's a straight line, I can go across that line on whatever whatever percentage of my 1RM that I want, and it'll tell me what velocity that I should be at for that percentage of my 1RM. So when I'm training and, and warming up, I have a velocity goal in mind, not a load goal, a velocity goal, and whatever load is is being used to produce that velocity is what load I use that day. And sometimes, and most of the time, because I'm a busy academic who is very tired, very tired if I'm honest, uh, 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 a lot of the time, and I think a lot of people might, might resonate with that, um, I can now train knowing that my tiredness or my psychological stress, my uh, anything that might impact my performance is going to be accounted for by using a, a linear position transducer to, to measure my velocity. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that because I'm, I'm, I, I believe as well that when people are paying you to train them, A, you're trying to have that risk and reward um, mm. for them. Like you're trying to make sure that they, they, suffer, high, they, they suffer low risk for high reward. Mm. But also like time is money for everyone. Yeah. So like using simple tools like that is that's why you hire a coach who can do stuff with that, be, stuff like that with you or implement RAR and all these things. Is because that you are actually saving them a lot of time for them working that stuff out themselves as well. Yeah. And like you like you said, you're a, you're a busy man, and doing it that way is by far the most efficient, um, time wise, and not just time wise, but also you're getting the best result for your um, for your work, which mm. is fantastic. And there's other ways to do this if you don't have these tools like VBT type tools. Like if you're if you're a coach, we can do other like movements, mimic movements that are looking at that individual's performance for the day. You could just do an eye test: is that bar moving quick today relative to what that individual can normally do? Or we can do other things like throwing, jumping, and all sorts of that, that, all sorts of movements like that. I was going to mention jumping. Yeah, yeah. and the, these are measurable movements as well. We can have a a chalk mark up on the wall, and can they jump as high as usual? Or is it a lot lower? And this, again, just alters your decision-making for the day. Are we going to take maybe a more gentle session for this person because they need a little bit of love and TLC? Or are they a high state of readiness and we can actually throw a little bit more on them at that day? What Tim was saying earlier with always playing to a velocity profile, this is just auto-regulation. You are finding the right stimulus that your body can handle for that day. And these are many variables, your sleep, nutrition, daily stresses, whatever it happens to be. Our body it changes quite regularly. But having this type of variable, it's just, it just making sure you're getting the, the right dose that you can handle for that day, you can recover from, and then come back for round two on the next day. And that's just the perfect steady state of adaptation that we're looking for. Um, Tim, is there any downsides to like VB training? And um, also, is there, 
is there kind of like what kind of other information can you capture from like your your, um, your Excel sheet? Have you have you caught any other information? Have you used it as well as for strength for hypertrophy as well? Um, so, to an, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, to answer uh, uh, answer the first question, yeah, there are downsides to it. Like most most position transducers are quite expensive. Um, particularly How much did yours cost? Mine cost about five hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. Um, and it's not the best one on the market. Like I'm happy to admit that. Um, the the one that is the best one on the market is probably Gym Aware. Um, and if you want one Gym Aware unit, you're looking at three thousand plus dollars. Um, so we we have Gym Awares at Sydney because because we're a we're a business and and uh, we're a, like, we're we're able to afford that. Um, I use a Gym Aware within my PhD. Uh, I think I think I think the Vitruve does does fine. Yeah. Like I I don't think it's dramatically different. It's sometimes um, just because it's the trend, right? That it's rather than that one piece of information. Yeah. Because it it's a trend, especially if you're looking at yourself, it's going to be you can use something else. But whereas Absolutely. if you're bringing athletes in and you're testing them, you probably want the thing that gives you the best information straight off relative to other athletes. Yeah. If you yeah, know what yeah. I mean. So, yeah. Yeah. So we got Gym Aware because of its accuracy. Yeah. Um, Gym Aware has an angle sensor in it, so it will always be able to measure what the vertical force or vertical velocity That's is awesome. at, at, at any given time. So there's a bit of um, cost associated with that engineering. Um, but I think, I think the downside as well is that you can get really caught in the numbers. Um, so, so for someone like me, I, I love the numbers. It feels like I'm being coached. Like it's a, it's a really weird, um, way to, uh, to think about it, but I, I really, really enjoy measuring velocity and looking at my spreadsheet to see what I, what I'm capable of that day. But for other people, they can get really dredged in, in yeah. the numbers. Um, and that can, that can lead to people just overthinking their training dramatically. Uh, and that's and that's fair. Like I think that's um, and I think that's quite common as well. Um, uh, sorry, what was your second question? Well, first of all, I was going to just say with that, it's like you found your dopamine rush in the numbers. <laughs> it's like oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's my serotonin. Yeah. That that feels good. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I I do think that's fantastic because we've used um, push bands as a as a VBT trainer, and we've used it as like with three four people training at the same time where. You kind of like you'll have the same way. You, you lift up as fast as possible. You get a little beep if you've got it in the right time. You're like, oh, feels good. <laughs> Step yeah, away. Yeah. And it, like it manages, it manages that like, kind of like, a, like you said, it's like it feels like a trainer. It does. It feels really nice because that beep is like when you've hit at the speed feedback. that you're trying to get. It's that instant feedback. It's kind of like you did it, which can't be seen like in other ways. And uh, I know Mitch did mention the, the human eye. Well, sometimes it's just like it's there's such a fault in that. Like, well, humans can um, we. Uh, we obviously can take in so much information. We can be so biased towards what we want to see sometimes. So there can be um, misleading information there. The best thing with VBT too, it teaches intent so quickly. Yeah. I think that has been the best way to go, hey, this is how we actually move the bar. Having a metric right in front of us that flashes red or green or has a happy beep. They Absolutely. want that. They want that little hit, yeah. and they'll work hard for it. And like um, with a hypertrophy culture, like sometimes the intent is just not there enough. And oh, that was and, the second question. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's where, yep. I'm getting, that's where I'm getting out yep. of this one. Um, but the idea is, is like um, uh, um, with with intent, like that's also the downside of BBT, right? Because you've got to expect that whoever you're putting underneath the bar is actually moving at their maximum intent. And if they're having a bad day, then or they 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 are suffering from an injury, that intent could be dropped back, right? They could be Absolutely. not actually pushed maximum. So it's really like you've got to make sure. And I suppose that is going to tell you anyway, but you've got to make sure that someone who's using a VBT trainer is actually pushing at maximum intent to get the best yeah. information from yeah, it. Yeah, that's why that's why warming up is so important generally. Yeah, psychologically, physically. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. Let's throw on to Tim, so uh, extra two uh, little, little words. How much data that you've built up, Tim, you have such accuracy to know, oh, this is a bad date. That's absolutely fine. I'll be back to my baseline in a day or two. Just having one or two random cracks of VBT, you'll never really get a true read of where you're at. It'll just be where you're at in the moment, not a more global view of where your strength is at. Like yeah. That made sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Like I think uh, the more the more I use it, the more I've, I understand myself and, and how I operate um, with – uh, with regard to how my velocity changes with increases in load, um, and I think I think another uh, uh, something that's just popped into my mind, like another benefit is that I used like when I was younger and and not using any type of velocity based training at all, um, it's really easy for a load to be programmed in uh, in uh, programmed in your program, and and you're thinking I have to lift this, yeah, I, yeah. I I have to lift this, 
Um, and if you're not feeling strong that day, that RPE will just dramatically skyrocket. And, and then it just won't move as well as you intended to. And all of a sudden, you're fixated now on load and you're not fixated on performance. And, and you just feel rubbish. Like yeah. you, can walk, yeah, oh. you can walk out de-hearted. And we, we know what that does to people. We know they just don't come it back ruins the next me. day. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely ruins me. So like, yeah, like I... Um, That's why you love BPT. So yeah, yeah, like, like, like I was, uh, 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 was going to say like I... Um, and, and some people uh, and, and some people listening might be able to resonate with this, but something I struggle with is what's called rejection-sensitive dysphoria. Um, which is where you experience really, really intense emotional pain to any type of rejection, like, wh- like whether you perceive it or whether it's actual. And for something like missing a, like, like, or like not even grooving it properly, like, like if it wasn't performed in something that That's was, nice. like, like, like if it wasn't performed in a way that I wanted to, oops, sorry, um, if it was performed in a way that I didn't want it to, boom, big rejection, big, big rejection. And like you just feel crap, like you just feel so crap. Um, and, and something like a velocity based train just makes me fixate on the velocity, which is always going to be there, right? The velocity is always going to be there. It's, it's the load that changes and yeah, it's, it's made me feel a lot more comfortable with training, which, which, which was interesting. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't expect that to happen, but yeah, it was interesting. It's, It's also like the, um, we do spend too long worrying about the actual load of a bar sometimes as well. Like, Mm. so, um, for certain stimuluses to be applied, sometimes load just seems to be everything. Whereas well, right now what we're talking about is we're talking about the velocity of that load being moved, which mm. is such a such a massive factor. And quite often that people just think that they have to put more weight on the bar, more weight on the bar. And there is actually like that, that driving the intensity behind the bar is actually a completely different kind of sensation, right? Like it's it, however much it's hard to explain you might be able to explain what I, my thought process better okay we'll see yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so the the intention to move is just so so important like and we've known that for decades um so a study that comes to mind 1993 from a well-known canadian physiologist um uh, uh, digby sale um uh and and his student at the time david bam he he rigged people up in a like in a calf raise type type machine, um, and uh, there were two conditions. One condition was they had to press as hard as they can, but the system was designed to not move. So it was a, it was an isometric contraction, but the intention was there to move. It's just that the actual movement didn't happen, and they phrased that as velocity was zero, right? Because there was no there was no change in the joint angle, so therefore velocity was zero. And then they had another model which did move. Um, uh, but still had the same intention, same everything. But the only difference was that there was no movement in one and movement in the other, and the strength response was exactly the same. Like whether like whether movement happened or not, the intention was key. And that study has just been so uh, 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 the, uh, the word is seminal um, in our in our industry, where where when we're trying to sh- tell clients or even students, because I obviously come from a student perspective, when when we're trying to tell students about how to train people, it's about that intention to move, even when there's no movement at all. And that's going to get the muscle working the way that we want it to move because that's how mechanical tension is developed. Right? High intentions means that you're going to recruit more motor units than normal. right? Uh, or, or, sorry, more motor units than if you were to do a submaximal contraction, like one that's a bit easy to do. So were the numbers the same or was actually the isometric more so? Oh, similar. Yeah, Similar. because because you can give someone longer time, and if you do have you have obviously everyone's very different, and we do have people who are slower to recruit more muscle fibers and layer muscle fibers on top. Mm. So if you give some that person a little bit more time um, before fatigue, where they can control the build up, then they can actually show higher peak outputs, right? You would do in theory. In theory, so. yeah. yeah. And we do theory. have these re- like these days we have different types of um, isometrics. We have these kind of for that reason exactly. Mm. We have what we call an overcoming isometric, whereas you force into something that doesn't really move as hard as physically possible. And then we have your more um, yielding isometrics, where mm. we're actually yielding to the weight. We're not overcoming it. We're allowing it to push on us, and we're just resisting it. And that's where the evidence must come from because it shows that we get very different muscle contractions from them two things, even mm. though we're not moving anywhere. If the intention is there, if the intention is that's there, exactly. the, that's the, that's, that's the, the key, key point. Yeah. 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 That's the key. Maybe not so much from a power perspective, but I think there's a community that's been working on this for ages is the bodybuilding community, the old mind muscle connection. 
yeah. be able to slow down something and squeeze the heck out of it and build a heap of tension out of it. It's been going around for years, these guys working from a hypertrophy lens and has been and had a lot of success, but it's slowing down and, and loading and feeling where they're trying to target. Yeah, there's a few there's a there's a couple of mechanisms with that. Mm. One is that if you're looking at the muscle and squeezing it and trying to squeeze as hard as you can, that's gonna increase your motor unit recruitment and therefore put tension on more muscle fibers, which will lead to more growth. The other thing is that the force velocity relationship, which I don't know, um, uh, well, meaning meaning as force increases, the velocity of sh muscle shortening has to decrease and, and vice versa. So when you lift something slow, but with high intention, that's, that's, that's why the mind-muscle connection works really well. If you lift something slow with high intention, you're gonna put more tension on those, uh, on those muscle fibers. And, and, that's, and that's why they grow. So if you deliberately move something slow, yes, there's a huge time under tension, which brings me back to time and magnitude. You, you get a huge time under tension, but the magnitude drops because you're deliberately slowing it down. And, and anyone can do that. Like pick up any weight that's mildly challenging and just lift it up slowly. Just lift it up slowly, right? And what you'll find is that it'll be easy to lift and your muscle won't feel anything. Like you won't feel anything. And that's exactly what's happened. You haven't felt anything. There's no there's little tension on that on that muscle to grow it. Um, and, and that's why bodybuilders are so good. They've got really good mind-muscle connection, but also a really good ability to train with high intentions. And it's really simple, but it's bloody hard to do. So hard, yeah. <laughs> it's so hard to do, yeah. We're going to just jump into this just a little bit more because obviously this is an interesting subject. And we are, gonna, we are touching into hypertrophy as well. Is that... But it, would it not depend on the resistance curve of the exercise as well and kind of like where Absolutely. the force is being applied? So you can't just be creating tension in any position whatsoever. It wants to be created tension in positions where there's actually something to really push against. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Like yeah. That, that tension needs to be there, which is why like a lot of famous... Still, and the, the more tension we get, the better. We still, yeah. we still want that external force applied against us to then create the force. Yeah, yeah. Like external, yeah. Like external force applied is obviously quite, uh, quite important. But take a bicep curl, for example, right? If you... If you, um, uh, if you do a bicep curl and then lift all the way up and then your elbow is at that 90 degree yep. range, that, um, uh, in, uh, uh, so that, that length, I suppose, uh, um, uh, which is called a moment arm, that, that length from where you're holding the dumbbell to where your joint is, is at its longest at that 90, at that 90 degrees. So at that point, that's where you're going to experience the most uh, uh, external resistance that's that's uh, that's applied to yep. you and and there's also maybe the point where the muscle is actually at its strongest as well which is where we want the most resistance right so and then is so keep going it's at its weakest actually at, that, at, the, at the weakest yeah 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 so the muscle will, will be at its weakest point there but but what you're feeling is a huge amount of tension at yeah. at, at, um, uh, at that point so um that's that's where you're going to experience that huge amount of tension but as you overcome that 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 distance gets shorter, right? And therefore, it becomes easier to lift. And that means that the experienced tension decreases. And that's why bodybuilders control their movements so that they can get their tension at the bottom range, through the middle range, which is going to be the hardest anyway. They're going to get that tension there anyway. And then as they overcome that hardest part of the movement, they still need to get tension at that point. So they, so they have to slow it down. Yeah. Um, so it's... Very unique strategy because because it relates to human strength curves, and yeah. like, which is why like I, I think that's a really important point is that load is obviously a part of it, but the human strength curve of any movement and that strength curve will differ depending on the movement that you're using and how you're doing it. Um, but the human strength curve of each movement will dictate how much tension you receive in that exercise. So like going back into a barbell bench press, like back into the powerlifting movements, back into strength, is also the the idea of intent. But well, it's easier to create intent in that more lengthened position anyway because that's where you're used to it. And, and if you practice the same movement over and over again, you're used to creating your intent from the bottom and then creating momentum through the rest. I was just going to mention to momentum, some yeah. massive level. So then are we saying that like if we do overcome in isometrics, would you recommend maybe an overcome in isometric in the middle portion a little bit more so where we may actually then teach ourselves to grind through the middle a little bit more or position or doing like half reps or things like that as well? Yeah, I think anything where like, if there is going to be momentum generated, there's no tension on that muscle. Yeah. Like, like just plain and simple. If there's, uh, uh, if there's momentum there, there's no tension, therefore no growth. So, so that's why I like isometrics um, uh, uh, in, those, in those added ranges. 
but that's why I also like bands. Yeah, yeah, like, like, like band and bands, bands and chains do the same kind of thing. Yeah, and some Louis vibes right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, well, talking about advanced training methods, this is kind of like that comes in a lot. It's like, well, like the, the idea of bands, chains, even even cables um, can be so good because we can actually change the angle. Like we're barbells, like we're pretty much always playing with gravity, right? Yeah, you you are. Yeah. Well, we are, yeah. We are always playing with gravity. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, with bands, um, we have these benefits of accommodating the resistance. Like, for example, with a band, um, the actual resistance is going to get greater as I pull the band in or like harder as I push the band out. So we can actually play around with these very different strength curves to what we'd normally experience on a, on a, on a barbell on a, or a regular dumbbell exercise right yeah yeah so bands are bands are typically used to reduce what's called a propulsive phase um oh sorry sorry reduce a braking phase to 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 maximize the, the the propulsive phase so in a bench press you will go down touch the chest i assume <laughs> and then uh, uh and then press the weight and then at like and if you lift that bar as fast as you possibly can there'll be a point where the amount of acceleration that you've created on the bar is going to eventually come out of your hands and and the bar will just continue to move right so what your body naturally does because you want to hold on to that bar your body naturally goes whoa, 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 wait a minute and then you actually reduce the tension that you experience at at that end range so what so what a band does is it continually produces that 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 propulsive force which is why in in sport like in strength and conditioning training for sports they almost always use bands and chains. And the reason why that is, is because sports rely on propulsive movements that don't slow down at the end. So like think about jumping, think about throwing, think about those types of movements. You can't slow down at the end. Like you have to put a massive propulsive force, propulsive acceleration into those movements. And, and bands and chains train, train that kind of action. And just bloody fun as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just a nice way to spice up the training for a, for a, for a block or a phase. Um, if you're getting bored or you're getting stagnant, it's just a nice way to spice it up as well. Yeah, a I lot agree. of love for it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to chuck that in my next block. Especially when, especially <laughs> when a big part. Well, we've we've all seen it, right? We've seen it with a with a bench press. We've seen fatigue set in as well. Like we've yeah. seen people actually get um, the momentum is not driving them up through the middle range enough. Well, what's the perfect exercise to then accommodate someone who sees that? Is the the perfect exercise is adding some chains or adding some bands that then allow them to break through that kind of build a bit more strength in them. And we we know, right? Like, tell me if we don't, but I'm pretty sure I've, I've read papers <laughs> on it. But um, the idea is we know that actual muscles, um, we know in different ranges, mu different muscle fibers normally recruit. Like, uh, yes, spe especially shown. especially with um, by articular muscle fibers, right? Yep. They actually different different angles, different ranges, different contractions. So we actually could be looking at training completely different muscle fibers while doing that. So you yep. get the different added hypertrophy, but at the same time, you get the actual strength built in them ranges that you have to neurologically learn. Yep, strength is strength is range of motion specific. Yep, yeah, it's, and it's, and velocity specific. You said exactly what I said just with that line. I yep. love that. Yep, exactly. Yep. And that's what we talk about all the time. Is like range of motion is normally not just good being able to get into it, but if we're trying to be strong, we want range of motion. We want strength through range of motion. Right? Yeah, but like I also think that that if you've got a range of motion that's really short, uh, uh, for example, there's no point in doing a full back squat. Like I saw a I saw a post from N Swiss the other day, um, and them coaching. Uh, oh, I, oh, I'm not sure who it was, but they were doing quarter squats with this like like very overloaded, like with yeah. like 150, 160 with a 1RM of 100, like like a 1RM to depth of uh, uh, of 100. But the reality is that's that's what they. That's what they do. I, they train in those ranges or okay. compete in those ranges. You've, you've got me on something here because I, I, I love that thought process because I actually think that when we're looking at runners and stuff like mm. that as well, like when, we're, when we're squatting, we're only ever maxing out in the bottom. Like, like you don't use your maximum weight for the middle or the top ever. Right? Because, no, because, because you've generated enough because, momentum from the bottom. And because the moment arm is also the hardest in the bottom, right? So therefore, the longest, we, would be, yeah. we would be a lot stronger relative to weight in the middle and the top. Yep. Or the top third top Correct. quarter yep. so therefore like it makes sense if you are trying to build up a ton of muscle um to actually do some quarter squats and like third squats yeah. with a much heavier weight in the top sad thing is that gets demonized because when we oh, walk yeah. into the gym the ego lifters are using them already <laughs> absolutely yeah and so like, like, yeah and that got that's had a lot of research um interest lately about um partial range of motion and where partials can be used with hypertrophy like and I think the over overarching or just strength, right, as well. Oh yeah, strength in general, yeah. Because we're neglect if if we only squat very full range, yep. Um, with heavy weight, then we know or, or 
and collect the weight for a second. But if we only have a squat full range of motion, we're only ever challenging our heaviest weight in the bottom. And then in VBT wise, we're using velocity, therefore we're only creating the speed out of the bottom. So we're only getting the momentum out of the top and we're never actually strengthening how strong we could be in that top third. Yeah, like, so like I think, I think the overarching rule is that the tension is greatest when the movement is the hardest. Yeah. Um, so like if you, if you miss a squat in, in, in the bottom, which most people do, like, mo like most, most general population people do, um, it'll probably be the hardest at that point and that's where you'll experience a lot of tension and therefore a lot of growth and a lot of strength. But if you're someone who explodes out of the hole in, uh, in a squat, which is very common in weightlifting and, and, and very powerful athletes, they'll experience a lot of tension in the mid-range. Um, and they get a huge uh, PAP or post-activation uh, post potentiation type effect. And because, because that adds a, um, a lot more momentum, then there could be limitations in the amount of tension that's experienced through, through there as well, which is why in bodybuilding, they always recommend slow controlled movements because they, they don't want momentum. Yeah. They don't want momentum. Until the last couple of reps where you bring the momentum in to get to squeeze at the last few. Exactly. Reps. Yeah. So I, I hate demonizing momentum because it's like, well, momentum's are still a tool that can help you through an exercise, right? Like, so whereas we'd want to start slow with hypertrophy, well, bringing in momentum at a later date for the last couple of reps, that makes sense. Yeah. But starting the reps with momentum makes no sense really most of the time for that. Oh, it yeah. yeah, it, it depends, depends on, on the, yeah, exactly. yeah, it depends on context, but yeah, but yeah mostly, yeah, I would say that, yeah. yeah. Wow, fantastic. I want to touch on PAP a little bit more before we wrap up? Yeah, yeah. as you just mentioned it, you just mentioned yeah. a bit of a post-activation yes, potentiation. And um, you, uh, the cool thing is, is we, we, we talk about it a lot and it's, it's this real phenomenon. And I think it's, it's so interesting and it's, it's very much been shown that, that certain like contrast exercises back to back can improve the other one. Um, but at the same time, the information out there is uh, a little bit wishy-washy. So it's hard to find exactly what the mechanisms at play are. But you said you've been looking into it recently. So, yeah. I'm, so I'm super interested to hear what you have to yeah, say. Yeah, I, had a, um, I had a student email me. Shout out to Josh. Um, oh, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Josh. Thanks. Um, uh, he's, a, uh, uh, he's a powerlifter as well. Um, yeah, I had a student reach out to me um, wanting to induce or introduce PAP type training um, and, and the methods associated with that, which are typically complex training, contrast training, uh, things like that. Um, and, and I thought, I think I might just research this a little bit more because, um, my role is education focused. I don't, I don't do a hell of a lot, um, a hell of a lot of reading, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. And, and I, I came across this review from 2019, um, which was by uh, Anthony Blazovich, who's a well-known biomechanist at Edith Cowan uh, University in Perth. Um, and essentially, I, it, was, it was a long article, but I'll, I'll try and summarize it. Essentially, uh, post-activation uh, post uh, 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 potentiation, sorry, I've got to stutter, um, is the transient, that's the key word, transient or, or, or temporary, increase in the ability to produce force from a conditioning stimulus. Um, and typically the post-activation potentiation kicks in when it is a high force movement that's potentiating a high velocity movement. So typically with complex training, contrast training, whatever, you'll see a high load back squat and they might do, I don't know, one, like one, one double or something like that at a, at a decent load, 85%. It's got, uh, uh, the load's got to be high. That's, that's also interesting. And it will potentiate jump height, right? Very, very... Uh, in a very short period of time but it doesn't work the other way around so if you were to do a jump first the jump doesn't potentiate the back squat uh, 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 performance and that was something that um that was something that josh mentioned is that he wanted to do a jump because he's powerlifting focused so he wants something to be able to improve his squat performance and he thought that the jump would increase his squat performance in a, in a very temporary way and i said well no because the mechanism uh, of it is that it works on light chain phosphorylation within, uh, uh, within the muscle itself. And, and light chains are not responsible for high load movements. Mice and heavy chains are responsible for high force movements. So, so, so what you end up with is that it's used in strength and conditioning a lot because we want jumps, throws, power type movements. So think of your typical team sports, rugby league, et cetera. That's why it's used there because it potentiates their jumps and their jumps are their most important metric. Strength is only used to develop power in, in those types of sports. So using a complex contrast training method, great, only if you're wanting to potentiate 
something like a high, something like a jump or a high velocity yeah. movement. That was generally what I found. But the other thing that was that was interesting, the effects of of the effects of PAP were typically negated with a proper warm up. Yeah, so heat. I've read previous information about heat, heat changes, yeah. and how mm. how it's actually the the temperature change in the muscle stimulated by the heavy weight yeah. that's then changed. It pretty has the same. It pretty works it on warms the same them mechanisms. Up. Yeah, yeah, it warms them up. It warms them up. And, and then the idea is that that's where I've seen, like more recently, that they're saying that warm ups negate it. So the the whole point is that when we actually apply temperature into our muscles, another reason for having a good warm up, as we apply temperature for every it's really tiny. If every fraction of heat increased in the muscle, you get stronger. Yeah. And then you get stronger and you get stronger. Obviously, there's a um, you lose you lose the gains r returns after a while. Yeah. So there is a certain peak temperature that's perfect, and then you can just start pushing yourself into fatigue. Yeah. But it's super interesting how like you yeah. can just like so a good warm up does a job. <laughs> yeah. Like that's what I would recommend yeah, to yeah. most people actually. Yeah. Like yeah. like unless you're that. the one percent of the one percent who are getting paid mm -hmm. to train and 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 compete, where something like a complex, a, a, a contrast or complex training method might 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 be useful. I think for most people, just warm up properly. Yeah. Mm. Just warm up properly, and and you'll see performance effects. Yeah, and and within and the session, within warm up, the uh, the warm is in the, in in the name, right? Like, as a lot of people do a lot of warm up with where maybe sometimes too much stretching and then go into jumps. Well, whereas actually getting the body nice and hot with some like. Cardiovascular work. Jump on a bike. So jump on a bike. Like, yeah, jump on a bike. Pop around like specific warm yeah, up with some specific yeah hopes, like with yeah. some jumps or like like not maximal jumps but like it needs to be progressive yeah. in 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 some way. Um, but yeah, like if you just jump onto a bar and start 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 doing some back squats, like you, like what you'll find is that your performance will potentiate over time because of your specific warm up, not not because of any cool thing that's happened with your um, subsequent warm up sets so yeah I found that really interesting actually yeah. I wasn't expecting that that's a beautiful end note for the, yeah for the yeah I wasn't there. expecting I that outcome make at sure all. you warm up <laughs> yeah warm up do, yeah definitely do you do have it. you always warmed up as a power lifter um I is it notorious for I know I know like we we definitely rush it is probably a good way to put it yeah. we do a lot of rolling we do a lot of like weird stuff with our arms and legs um but yeah me 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 personally I'm not great with warm-ups like I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to admit that yeah. Mainly because like I just oh, time is just so so short. But um, there is a, there is also a saying I'm gonna I'm, I'm a bit short of time. But there's also a saying about how you earn your right to not warm up. So yeah, like I it's kind of like after a long period of training, only once you've trained for like 10, 15 years and you've trained well, you've done your warm ups in the in the history. Yeah. Then you can kind of step into it a little bit earlier. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd say there is some kind of like evidence. There's there's some kind of understanding. You know your body so much. More. It makes sense, right? Yeah. Like, well, I wouldn't be starting off a new training or, or trying to personal best on a day where I haven't done any warm ups. No, no, no. I, yeah, yeah, I typically integrate my warm up within like within my warm up sets. So yeah. like for example, with a barbell back squat, like I'll just like sit down in in the bottom position and just like rock around. Um, a little bit just to make 180 sure. 180 on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Animal. And then and then I'll uh, like and then I'll and then I'll put 200 on yeah, and yeah. then I'll and then I'll have a go. Um, but but yeah, that's typically what yeah. I do is I just kind of like move around with the bar on my back. Um, yeah. And it, and it, and it typically works all right. So, um, but then again, I'm not I'm not elite. So that's that's something to consider as well. And we never know what them Chinese elite are actually doing. How they work. no <laughs> yeah. no, and I, and I don't and I don't think we'll ever know, yeah. uh, unfortunately. <laughs> and you know what? Good for them. They're so yeah. they're they're so good at what they do. So um, I think I think we just got to be we just got to watch and be amazed. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It's pretty amazing. We well, just want to say a massive thank you for joining us on the potty today. We learned so much. It was um, very informative, and I wish we had yeah, more time to dive into more subjects because that was a that was a lot of fun to go through. It went super quick. Yeah, it did. <laughs> did, it, did. It? Yeah, it was fun. It's really good. Like, like so, so much information there for um, for the listeners. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very I'm very excited, and um, yeah, hope hope people enjoy it. Happy to hear. Happy to hear feedback. If you want to email me, or I'm happy to plug my email. If, yeah, if, go for if, it. If that's oh, yes, right. Yeah. So happy to be, happy to be emailed. Happy to be contacted at Timothy Davies D A V I E S at Sydney Edu .au. Um, and I happy happy to discuss more. Like I'm I'm, him. I'm always keen. I, I get a lot of emails. Oh, I've so, got questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm always I'm always Just get ready keen. to see James Brim pop up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always I'm always keen to receive emails and happy to discuss more and. Um, yeah, more than more than happy. More You're than a legend. Happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, guys. Cheers.